Greetings. This presentation is Neurological Consequences of Spinal Degenerative Disease Associated with Vertebral Subluxations. I'm Christopher Kent, Professor and Director of Evidence-Informed Curriculum and Practice at Sherman College of Chiropractic in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Let's begin by discussing the nature of the vertebral subluxation. A subluxation is a loss of proper position or motion of a vertebral segment which may impact proper nervous system function. In 1927, Stevenson defined subluxation as a condition of a vertebra that has lost its proper juxtaposition with the one above, the one below, or both to an extent less than a luxation which impinges nerves and interferes with the transmission of mental impulses. Mechanical and degenerative changes associated with vertebral subluxation may result in a variety of neurological consequences. The basic physical mechanisms of biological communication include first, diffusion of particles along concentration gradients. Uh, this involves such things as osmosis and diffusion. The second is diffusion of quanta along electromagnetic gradients. This category includes the various electrophysiologic signals that are produced by the body, uh, such as electrocardiography, uh, electroencephalography, um, electromyography, and so forth. The third is transmission of substances within structured channels. This may include on a gross level, uh, cerebrospinal fluid circulation, on a cellular level, axoplasmic flow. And the last, of course, is wave propagation where we have a compression rarefaction type phenomenon. The putative neurobiological mechanisms that are associated with vertebral subluxation include cord compression and adverse cord tension, nerve root compression, local irritation, vertebral artery compromise, autonomic dysfunction, changes in coherence and oscillatory patterns, and disafferentation and neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is particularly exciting because there's evidence that not only can the nervous system rewire itself in response to inputs, it can also produce anatomical change. So the two main mechanical factors associated with neural dysfunction include compression and stretch. And earlier studies had suggested that peripheral nerves required a tremendous amount of compressive force to significantly alter their function. But in the early 70s, the work of Sharpless at the University of Colorado revealed that a pressure of only 10 millimeters of mercury produced a significant compression block. Uh, this has been likened to the weight of a dime or the threshold of perception of your finger on the back of your hand. So we see that it doesn't take very much compressive force at all to significantly alter the function of a nerve root. Uh, this is the experimental setup he used. He exposed a sciatic nerve, had an electrical stimulator, was able to compress it using a thin balloon uh, working against a plastic foot and a pressure transducer recorded the amount of pressure being applied. And of course, an oscilloscope on the other end allowed recording and measurement of the amplitude of the compound action potential. Interestingly, 20 years later, uh, Kano's team published a paper in Spine where they came up with exactly the same figure. They found that compression of the nerve roots of the cardi equina with as little as 10 millimeters of mercury resulted in decreased action potentials. Uh, very interestingly, the dysfunction involved is not confined to degeneration at the site of compression but also extends to the primary sensory neurons within the dorsal root ganglion. We've also seen clinically that nerve root compression may result in symptoms that are not of a domaternal distribution and that are not confined to the segmental level of the compression. Rydovic noted that venous blood flow to spinal nerve roots was blocked with as little as five to 10 millimeters of mercury pressure. So this indicates that the venous drainage can be compromised with even lower levels of compression than those described by Sharpless and Kano. Radovic's team noted that the resultant retrograde venous stasis 
is a significant cause of nerve root compression and that impairment to nutrient flow is present at similar low pressures. In human studies, Ando's team looked at 114 surgical patients and they found that sensory nerve action potentials decreased in amplitude when the lesion was at or distal to the dorsal root ganglion. Therefore, they concluded the amplitude of the SNAPs or sensory nerve action potentials with lumbar foraminal stenosis uh, should be decreased. So when we see a diminution in the foramina on imaging studies, be they plain film radiograph, CT, or MR studies, um, we can suspect that the amplitude uh, of those action potentials will be lowered. House also noted that nerve root compression can exist without pain. Mechanical changes lead to circulatory changes, as we just found out. Another aspect is chemical involvement. Inflammatogenic agents, such as histamine or substance P, may cause chemical radiculitis. There may also be disturbed cerebrospinal fluid flow, and the influence of the sympathetic system may result in synaptic sensitization of the CNS and peripheral nerves, creating a vicious cycle. So we see that there's an entire constellation of functional and pathological changes that occur with spinal degeneration, which can initially be triggered by vertebral subluxation. Another mechanism that's physical in nature that's often overlooked is stretch. And we know that alterations in the position and therefore the spinal curves can result in stretch. And the investigators found that at 6% strain, the amplitude of the action potential had decreased by 70% at one hour and returned to normal during the recovery period. But at 12% strain, uh, conduction was completely blocked. So if we look at the work of uh, those who have investigated adverse mechanical tension on the spinal cord, uh, and those who have looked at what happens when nerve roots are stretched, we know that not very much stretch at all is necessary to, uh, again, decrease the amplitude of the compound action potential. If we take a look at these photomicrographs, we can see some of the pathological changes that occur in dorsal root ganglia secondary to compression. Uh, this is a control animal, and I'd just like you to take a look at the cytoplasm and the nucleus and compare the overall density to this. Uh, this was from an experimental animal where there was an artificially induced spinal strain. Uh, this work was done back in the 40s, and they found that there was a chromophobic response. The cells took up less dye than the healthy cells, and with time, we would see um, actual destruction and death of, of the nerve. So this chromophobic response was a a precursor to uh, nerve death. What was that? Okay, we'll edit that. In areas of artificially induced spinal strain, they also noted that organs innervated by nerves associated with those segmental levels exhibited pathological changes. Uh, these are liver cells from an experimental animal, and you can see at the arrows that we have these large areas uh, termed sinusoids, where fluids can accumulate. But uh, when there was artificially induced spinal strain, uh, the cells associated with those levels underwent cloudy swelling, and the sinusoids could no longer be visualized. Another mechanism of neural dysfunction associated with vertebral subluxation is disafferentation. And basically, this means that the body's perception of itself and the environment is compromised because of distortion of the afferent input. Um, in the computer vernacular, they talk about garbage in, garbage out. And if we look at this diagram, it discusses what several authors termed local sensorial conversational tone. In other words, the 
normal flow of afferent information from the various structures in the intervertebral motion segment to the CNS. Uh, and we can see that we have the ligaments of the spine, we have the intervertebral disc, uh, we have the facet joints which have uh, a rich endowment uh, of sensory fibers and mechanoreceptors of various types. Uh, we have muscle sensory organs, we have integumentary sensory organisms. Do that again. <clears throat> this diagram illustrates what the authors termed local sensorial conversational tone. And the concept is that the intervertebral motion segment is richly endowed with apparatus to provide sensory information concerning the position and location of the vertebral segments. Uh, receptors have been identified in the vertebral discs, particularly the outer annulus, the spinal ligaments. Uh, we have a variety of mechanoreceptors that have been identified in the posterior joints. We have muscle spindle apparatus, we have sensors in the integument, and of course the viscera have uh, chemoreceptors. And all of this information is ultimately fed to the dorsal root ganglion, which lies partly within the intervertebral foramen and is therefore susceptible to mechanical compression. When I was a student a long time ago, we were taught that the intervertebral disc was avascular and aneural, that it did not have a direct nerve supply or blood supply. And today we know that the outer annulus particularly is well endowed with um, nociceptive fibers, fibers capable of sensing pain, and that disruption of the intervertebral disc in and of itself is at least potentially a pain generator. And if we look at the studies that have been done uh, examining these structures. Uh, Bogduk's team published on the nerve supply to the human intervertebral discs. Uh, that was a, a very significant study because, as mentioned, it was thought that the discs were avascular and aneural. This was in part due to the staining techniques that were used at the time by using uh, different staining techniques and by using uh, immunohistochemical studies looking for uh, antibody responses characteristic of nerve tissue, lo and behold, a number of investigators found that there are nerves associated with the discs. Mendel, Wink, and Zimney's team talked about neural elements in human cervical discs. Uh, Bogduk, again, the innervation of the cervical discs, also published on that topic. And McLean, Wyck, and others talked about mechanoreceptor endings in human facet joints. And if we take a look at this illustration, uh, we can see that the blood supply is also pretty robust. Um, what's been done with this specimen is what's termed the Spalterholz process, which renders bone translucent. And by injecting the vessels with dye, uh, we can see that. And when we take a look at some of the imaging studies, I'd like you to remember this, because if we look at the end plates, you can see that the end plates are supplied by those vessels and when we see degenerative changes on the end plates that compromise the diffusion of particles between concentration gradients, uh, lo and behold, uh, this accelerates the degenerative process. Uh, Jang's team talked about the nature and distribution of innervation of human supraspinal and interspinal ligaments. And Ralmi's team talked about immunohistochemical studies of nerves in lumbar spine ligaments. So again, structures that were classically thought to have little or no nerve supply uh, have been shown to be very important sources of uh, nerve supply. Uh, Fricke's team, nerve fibers innervating cranial and cervical meninges. We know that distortion of the meninges can occur secondary to vertebral subluxation, that the morphology of nerve terminals and their structural integration may change. And therefore, we also need to realize that there's a meningeal component to this process. Uh, here's a textbook showing 
common subluxations of the human spine and pelvis, and it compares cadaveric studies to imaging studies, and I'd like to share some of those with you. Uh, here's a text I did on chiropractic MRI with my co-author Len Vernon a number of years ago, and in it we talked about uh, some of the degenerative changes that are associated with vertebral subluxation. Uh, Glenn Burnett and Rauschnig published a little booklet called Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Lumbar Spine, Nerve Root Canals, Disc Abnormalities, Anatomic Correlations, and Case Examples. And if we take a look at the normal IVF, um, we can appreciate the nerve root here. Uh, the nerve root is surrounded by fat. We also have vessels. Uh, here you can see the ligamentum flavum, or yellow ligament, and the posterior joints here, uh, the intervertebral disc, and the outer annular fibers of that disc. And if we compare that to a segment where we have rather advanced degenerative change, we can appreciate that the nice red bone marrow uh, has been replaced by this, this yellow material, which is, is fatty in nature. And we can see, again, this fatty material is not uniform in its distribution. If we compare this motion segment to this motion segment, both exhibit advanced degenerative changes, but the nature of the degenerative process is very different. Why? Because of different pathomechanics associated with different patterns of vertebral subluxation. And here we can see uh, a hypertrophy and corrugation of the ligamentum flavum and the combination of this developing osteophyte and the exaggerated ligamentum flavum anatomy here uh, shows you how the nerve root can therefore be entrapped. So if we look at some MR images and some plain films uh, in real clinical settings, I, I think we'll, we'll make this real for you and you'll find it very interesting. Uh, as you recall, um, Two major MR sequences that we use are T1-weighted images where marrow fat appears bright and T2-weighted images where water appears bright, specifically uh, the healthy hydrated intervertebral disc, uh, the cerebrospinal fluid that produces a sort of pseudomyelographic appearance on MR, and areas of edema and inflammation will also demonstrate increased signal intensity. So this is a very interesting case where the patient was given plain films, had complained of low back pain, orthopedic and neurological examinations failed to reveal anything significant, and it was felt that the patient perhaps was a malingerer or was suffering from uh, something other than a biomechanical and neurological disorder because the plain films look pretty good except for some thinning of the L5-S1 disc. And the individuals who were reading the film and managing the case said, well, that's a manifestation of normal aging. But as one of my teachers taught, if indeed it's normal aging, why isn't it the same throughout the spine? Why does it occur to different degrees and at different levels? Hmm. So. On the T1-weighted image, we see something kind of interesting. Um, because marrow contains fat, we usually have a nice sharp image here, high-intensity image. And notice that here the intensity is low. So that marrow that we saw on the cadaveric study earlier is being replaced by that degenerative material. And if we look at a T2-weighted image, the so-called water image, Notice the CSF lights up, and notice that this disc demonstrates internal disruption as well as decrease in signal intensity, indicating desiccation or drying out. But perhaps more significantly, on the T2-weighted image, we have increased signal intensity suggestive of edema and inflammation. So this obviously isn't the same patient, but I matched as best I could uh, with uh, a cadaveric specimen. And as you can see, we have this nice, healthy red marrow here. Uh, here we see a little bit of disruption of the disc. And here we have advanced disc degeneration, and you can see the anterior osteophyte formation here. Obviously, something's going on here that isn't going on here. I remember uh, 
in a medical legal case uh, where an adverse witness was stating that spinal degenerative disease is normal aging. And my response was simply, well, doctor, I have two questions for you. Um, if it's normal aging, why is it different in different people? And in an individual, how much older is the degenerated disc than the relatively healthy disc? So if we look at the degenerative cascade, the temporal profile, what happens? First of all, we have the vertebral subluxation where pathomechanical changes lead to a tugging on the ligaments. This tugging on the ligaments can lead to focal inflammation, which will lead to yellow marrow infiltration, as we saw in the specimens, and the development ultimately of osteophytes. And in the booklet by Glenn et al., they staged the process, and uh, this is very helpful. Uh, grade one they call normal. As you can see, here's the nerve root. There's plenty of space. The articular relationship at the posterior joints is good. There's no posterior displacement of disc material. And if we look at the MR image, once again, nice bright marrow fat here on the T1-weighted image. And here we can see the nerve root. Grade two is slight. And notice here that the articular relationship is no longer normal. You can see the displacement of the facet joint. You can also see the beginnings of end plate pathological change. And you can see the nerve root here on the MR. Once again, uh, less space in there. And the nerve root looks a little smaller. And we learned that it takes very little pressure to influence the function of a nerve. Grade three, they called mild. Here we're starting to see some osteoarthritic change going on here. Um, potential ankylosing of the joint. Again, the nerve root is smaller and finally moderate. Uh, you can see the entrapment and the swelling of the nerve root. As we learned, when a nerve root is compressed, it can swell. And finally, severe, where the body has, in effect, immobilized that motion segment through advanced degenerative changes. Here's another interesting case, uh, lumbar spine. Plain films were read as normal, and you can see why. It's because the uh, disc spacing looked pretty good, but this person was complaining of pain, not of dermatomal distribution. So uh, looking at the MR, we see here that there's some anterior displacement of disc material, some inhomogeneity of the disc signal here. And if we look at the T2-weighted image once again, we can see that the vertebral end plates, despite the fact that there's good disc spacing, are demonstrating increased signal intensity, again, suggestive of edema or an inflammatory process. And when those inflammatogenic products bathe the structures of the intervertebral motion segment, uh, we can have pain. In the cervical spine, we can see a relatively healthy spine in this case. If we draw a line along the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies, we can perhaps see some very minor degenerative changes beginning to occur, causing a change in the contour of the CSF signal. Uh, if we look at a transaxial view, we can see the anatomy quite nicely here. We can see the anterior root, the dorsal root, the dorsal root ganglion. Centrally, we can see the cord, the cerebrospinal fluid, the lamina the bifurcated spinous process, the vertebral body. But what I'd like you to notice is how well demarcated in this individual the various layers between the muscles are delineated. It's very clear. If we look at this patient, who again had radiographs that had minimal findings, uh, we can see that in this case, we have an uplifting of the posterior longitudinal ligament. We have change in the contour of the CSF signal here as well as here. We have potential impression on the cervical cord. Not a good situation because the cervical cord, as you know, is very sensitive. Uh, if we take a look at a transaxial image there, uh, again, we can see the disc material. 
Uh, we can see an osteophyte here that's not visible on the contralateral side, but notice that those nice sharp lines of demarcation between the back layer muscles are, are no longer as clearly defined. So here's another case of an individual who has a loss of the normal cervical curve. If you draw along, along the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies, uh, you can see that we have some osteophytic change here, but again, it was thought to be no big deal. But if we take a look at a normal cervical spine and draw lines along the inferior aspect of each vertebral body, you can see how those lines converge posteriorly. However, in the film I just showed you, uh, notice that that's no longer the case, that we actually have a divergence of the lines here, and we have a disrelationship in the high cervical spine as well. So if we take a look at a cadaveric specimen, we can see how degenerative disease differs depending on the nature of the pathomechanics, that we have nice red marrow here, we have yellow degenerative material here and here. Uh, you can see the end plate sclerosis that's developing here, and you can see what's happening posteriorly again just by drawing that line in your mind's eye. If we were to look at a magnetic resonance image, a T2-weighted image of the patient whose radiographs I just showed you, um, there's a surprise. The surprise is, first of all, there's desiccation of the disc at the involved level and internal disruption. But note, too, that we have increased signal intensity once again in the vertebral bodies, again suggesting edema and inflammation. And finally, I'd like to share with you an MR animation that shows how individuals who have subtle radiographic findings may have vertebral subluxations that potentially have significant neurological consequences. In that film where things were moving nicely, we can contrast it with this film. Perhaps we can show you better with the laser where even though we have good disc spacing, as the person flexes and extends, you can see that degenerative material is rhythmically thrusting against the anterior aspect of the spinal cord. And again, if we compare that with a relatively healthy spine, you can see how, if we draw a line along the posterior aspects of the bodies, things look pretty good. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It was my privilege to share it with you. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at Sherman College of Chiropractic. I'd also be happy to provide a copy of the PowerPoint and a bibliography to any of you who attended the conference. Thank you for your attention.